Last night, I had this really intense, vivid dream. And for the first time ever, what I did when I woke up in the morning was pick up this and a pen. And I began to write down what my dream was all about while it was still fresh in my mind. And the only reason I did that is because of a woman who is our guest for this week's episode. Her name is Juliet and she's a dreams expert. And she tells us that our dreams are always trying to send us messages about our life and that we can learn to interpret our dreams and find out what they mean for us. For me, one of the most fascinating aspects of human life is dreams. You know, I think everybody's curious about their dreams and what do they mean and is there a real meaning to them? Are they just brain candy? But I think after that interview there, there's one thing that certainly became really clear to me is that dreams are genuinely able to teach us things if we're able to listen deeply enough. Um, feel like I'm ready to go home and start journaling for myself now that I've learned a lot more about it and I'm sure everybody else is going to be super excited to hear and, and see the, the episode. We travelled from Balloch to South Queen's Ferry, a town near Edinburgh, to interview Juliet Lee for this week's episode. Juliet grew up in a working class family in the tough Glasgow suburb of Easter House, but admitted that even from an early age she felt different from the other kids and didn't really fit in. Juliet excelled at school and university and went on to become a chemical engineer, which brought a great salary but didn't bring her any fulfilment or joy. Juliet also ended up in a marriage that wasn't right for her, and as she wasn't living an authentic life from the heart, Juliet sank into depression and ended up in a dark place. Then one particular day 21 years ago, something completely unexpected and dramatic happened for Juliet, which changed the entire course of her life. Who am I? What am I doing? This marriage is wrong, this job, everything's just wrong. Um, and it culminated in me being really depressed. Uh, so much so I ended up at the doctor. And he wanted to write me a prescription for Prozac. And I said, I'm not taking it, I don't want it. And he handed me a counsellor's card. And it was the psychotherapist counsellor. And I'd never even thought about counselling or psychotherapy, I'd never heard of it. And I rang her and it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. And that started me on the whole journey of who am I and why am I doing what I'm doing. That process then led to um, a huge, significant um, awakening. And it wasn't all foreseen, I had no idea, sense of it coming. I, had, I just knew I'd been in a really dark, difficult place and was starting to work my way out of it through talking, basically. Um, and it was on the 20th of February 1999 that the chaos in my mind, thinking I was literally going insane, what do I do? You know, I was brought up a Roman Catholic, um, I had a very strong faith. I was very devout in the sense of I always felt a personal connection to, some, to something. But because I was brought up in Roman Catholicism, then that was the language that I had. So leaving a marriage... You know, given nobody had ever been divorced before either, you know, in my family. So it was a lot of pressure, huge pressure. And not understanding what was breaking down either, you know, what's going on here. And the pain and the chaos in my head to the point where I thought I'm almost losing my mind. And I remember on my knees, on the bedroom floor, feeling as if I was literally holding on to my sanity by a thread. And I just said, God help me. I was on, on my knees just, and whatever that means to anybody else, to me at that time it was, I have absolute faith in something, like, help me. And I went to bed that night, and when I woke up in the morning, it stopped. All the not, uh, most peaceful, serene, it's difficult to describe because it was the most profound connection to everything and every dimension that I could feel. I was so alive, I can't even explain. And I walked into the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I looked at my eyes and it was like I was looking at me for the first time. 
my eyes were alive. I was looking at myself for the first time in my life and I could see, and this is hard for me to say, but a gold round my head to the point where I was trying to touch it so I could see energy. And I just got in the, I just got in the car and for the next two hours I just drove around in the car. Just didn't matter where I went and what I was doing. I stayed in that state of utter awakeness, utter connection, utter aliveness. So serene, peaceful, it's hard to even articulate. And three weeks later I left. So I left my home, my marriage, I left everything. Um, and by that time I started a new job with Zeneca, so I um, rented my little house and then on it went, this huge journey of transformation. Um, but that 20th of February 1999, that profound awakening to a whole other dimension of who we really are and who I was and my connection to that and my faith in something that I'd had all my life but suddenly was personal, deeply personal and very, very real. And from then on, I started working much, much more with my dream life and everything else from there. So I'm really fascinated to hear, obviously when we've spoken before, you talked about your abilities that you've owned over time around interpreting your dreams. So I'd really love to hear more about the practice of how did you discover that dreams maybe had a deeper meaning and then how did you craft that practice over time? What's interesting actually, because the, the, the therapist that I worked with didn't really talk about dreams much. And it was just, she encouraged me to journal, to start journaling, you know, what what I was feeling, what I was thinking, or just what I was noticing. Um, and it then evolved into me writing down my dreams but not because of any particular person that had suggested I do it. So I don't even quite know how I made the choice to, to start writing down my dreams as well as journaling. It just started to happen. This is 20 years worth of dreams and what I've done for 20 years is kept kept all the journals and at the end of the year and what I do is I number them and I date them so that I know what, what particular segment of the year this was. now sits beside my bed so I always keep them beside my bed and that's the first thing I do in the morning is I'll write in them and the more I wrote the more prolific my dreams became and that's a really important thing to remember about your dream life it's a conversation with the deepest part of yourself so it's like any relationship the more energy you put into that the more attention you put into it the more fruitful it is so the fact that I was taking the time to write these down and using it as part of my journaling at that time meant that my dream life got stronger and stronger because I was actually paying more attention. So in the, in the beginning, I was just writing them down. I didn't really know quite what to do with it, but it just felt an important conversation or part of the conversation I was having with myself anyways in my journaling. And so then I started to read a bit more about, you know, dreams and working with dreams and and it was then I began to understand the work of Carl Jung. And that's how I first came across him, actually, was, was because of his great work on dreams and how important he felt that was in terms of personal growth and human experience and understanding the depths of who we are and actually what's actually going on. So I read then lots of his work, which I just think he's, the man was an absolute genius in terms of the legacy he's left mankind. To understand the dreams as a mirror of your psyche at this present moment. A pure reflection of who you are and what's going on in your life. But it's more than just that. 
So realising that by working with my dreams, I was actually being given guidance. It -hmm. wasn't just a reflection on this is where you're at in terms of your growth and here's some of the things you still haven't actually resolved or the difficulties you're having or there were actually information was coming through in terms of wisdom and guidance how I could make choices that were different, who, who, what kind of people were, were or weren't good for me in my life, where even to live, you know, everything. It, was, it would inform everything about my life. And the most important, there was there's two hugely significant dreams. When you start working with your dreams, you realise that some are just a, they're a snapshot of you and what's going on in your life. And your dream life will speak in metaphor and symbolism. So we'll use symbols from your life to try and have that communication with you. So we'll use people you know to try and highlight qualities in yourself that they may or may not have that you've not paid attention to. So that reflection, if you like, of where I am. But it will also give you information on almost what may even happen next. Um, the most significant healing dream I had, and it was nearly, it was not long after I started journaling, so it's almost 20 years ago now. And it's worth sharing that dream because that dream sustained me for 20 years of all the healing work that I've had to do. We all have pathology, we all have difficulties, you know, and it's sometimes, you know, what you've got to dig out of the basement is really dark and horrible, and it can take a long time, and it can take a lot of courage. And this dream was... I'm walking along a country lane by myself on a sunny day and I see what looked like a little shellfish, tiny, tiny little thing. And I pick it up and all I know in this dream is I have to get this to the sea. And as I'm walking along this country lane, this tiny little shellfish grows and grows and grows and grows into this monster so big I could barely carry it. I was almost buckling under the weight of this thing. And I just kept, I've got to get it to the sea. And it, it got so big and so huge, it was, I was so close to get, I could see the sea and I got to, the, I almost collapsed, but it just got there. And what I then noticed were all these women and children screaming on the beach, screaming at the sight of me coming down with this thing. But all the, the, the beach wasn't sand, it was all pebbles, it was all stones. And when I, I keep, as I'm walking down with this thing, I keep saying to them, you don't understand, it just needs to be free. You don't understand, it just needs to be free. And I free it into the sea. I actually, I do it, I manage to do it. And instead of getting a fantastic, you've done this thing, there's a male figure, grabs me, hauls me, it's a lifeguard, he hauls me into this hut and he's giving me hell because I've done this. I've released this thing. And I just keep saying to him, you don't understand, it needs to be free. So that dream, I could not understand that dream at all. But I knew that something very, very important was happening. And in that dream, and the dream was telling me, you will do it. You will do it. I just knew that whatever this thing is, whatever this monster is that I'm carrying, and, it, and it's huge, and I've been carrying it all my life, so basically an embryo in a shell. So this little shellfish, this embryo in a shell. So before I was even born, this trauma, huge trauma, which then was compounded. And I'm carrying it and I will do this. So in terms of how powerful dreams are in our healing journeys, when we think we're on our knees and we don't know how we're going to do this, and it can be extremely hard with some of the patterns that we need to heal, a dream life can give us a vision of hope that you will do it. You can do it. You've, you've got the capability. But when you've done it, some part of you or some part of what isn't going to like it. <laughs> so it isn't always about, right, I've managed to heal all this thing and everybody's going to be happy about that. No, they're not going to be happy about it. And it also showed me that part as well to prepare me for even when you've released all of this, not everyone's going to thank you for it. So... That was one hugely powerful dream that when I was going through a lot of, of different healing and working with my dream, it sustained that sense of, you're going to be able to do this. So our dreams can give us that vision and that hope. So no matter how many times I was on my knees, so no matter how many times, you know, when you're doing this kind of work, you think, oh, here we go again. I can do this. That struggle with that then became symbolic for no matter what life throws at you, 
you can always do it. So you always go back to that agreement, that lesson you got. That's right. I can do it. No matter what, I can do it. And that dream can be so powerful, it can give you that. Has there been any others, other dreams you've had where there's been big revelations about things that are happening or things that might happen? That's a really interesting question about that what might happen one. Because precognitive dreams are very real. And again, once you start working with dreams and you give it commitment, again, it's a relationship with that deeper self, then what starts to open up are, are lots of possibilities of um, not just healing, but, but understanding of what may be. Um, and, the, and the biggest example I have of that was when my father had prostate cancer. And he was a very, very, very fit man. Um, he was a painter decorator, no sense of illness whatsoever, diagnosed with prostate cancer, and it was terminal. It was, it was aggressive, and by the time we found out, it was too late. So for the first year of that, it was absolutely fine. I was living in York. My family were still in Hamilton, um, so I would come up and travel up to see them. Um, but in the second year of, of, that, of the cancer, he started to deteriorate. But I still travelled up and down and up and down. I had never returned to Scotland. I, had, I was the exile, I'm the black sheep. I'd gone away, I'd left. So I stayed down in the northeast. Even after I got divorced, I completely changed career. I was doing I had a different life, but I stayed in, in, in England. Um, and I was torn. I was torn with, with he, he's deteriorating. Um, what do I do? You know, do I come back? Do I not? My life is down there. Um, and my dad's younger brother had died, gosh, must have been a good decade before that. You know, so he'd been dead a long time. Um, and I had a dream where it was my Uncle Seamus and he always wore three-piece suits. My Uncle Seamus was a plaster and at weekend he wore a three-piece suit. Um, and alcohol was a big problem in Glasgow. He had a big problem with alcohol, which is what killed him in the end. And anyway, in this dream, he's standing, he suit trousers on and a shirt, but no waistcoat, no jacket, no tie. And my dad was standing next to him. And I'm looking at them both, and they're from here to, you know, a, a few metres away. And my Uncle James turned and he looked at me and he said, do you understand? And what he was showing me was the distance of time. And I just nodded. And I woke up from that dream and I've gone all, um, knowing there's a finite time here. So this thing about Scotland, whatever it is, you've not got a lot of time. And within two weeks, I had rented out my house in York um, I had rented out my brother-in-law's bachelor pad in Edinburgh, which just happened to be empty. I phoned my dad and said I'd be there in a fortnight, and he burst into tears. I got back here, got to Edinburgh, and within six weeks my dad passed away. And I am forever grateful for that dream, and for my uncle Seamus, we call him Seamus, his name is James, we call him Uncle Seamus, coming to me in that dream to tell me that's how much time I, I had six weeks with my dad, I spent all that time with him, took him home from the hospice, told him I'd get him, you know, it, it's, it's, it was being able to actually drive him around, be with him, and he knew why I'd done it. Um, and I was there with him when he died. And if it hadn't been for that dream, you might not have been with your dad when he died? No. I mean, I wouldn't have had the six weeks that I had with him to spend that time with him. And what I found, what I realised in the dream, that, that it didn't matter whether my choice was to stay in Scotland or not stay in Scotland. I just get here, be with him, and then figure it out from there. And, and what mattered was being here. Where does someone begin to, be that, to build that deeper understanding of what's actually going on with them at a deeper level, but how do they begin to interpret those dreams? What would your advice be? Oh, that's a good question, because there's, there's lots of tools, there's lots of different ways you can start looking at your dreams. And again, this is borrowed partly from Carl Jung, who will say that we've got three levels of dreaming. 
So we've got that level one is that surface level. So we're kind of sorting out stuff from the day, who we've been with, what we've said, and it's kind of just processing, if you like, you know, and you can take it at that surface level. And, and a lot of people do dismiss their dreams because they're only looking at that very surface level. And, and that's what we would call level one. And, and then level two is to say, actually, no, this is about my personal unconscious, my stuff. So what's going on with me, really? So when you look at the dream from that perspective, then what questions are this, is the dream asking of me about myself? So at that level, all the people in your dream are facets of you. So when you're working with your dream, asking yourself the question about who are these people in terms of how I feel about them, how I would describe them, what characteristics do they have, um, what does that mean for me? What are those qualities in me or not? You know, do I have those qualities or do I lack those qualities? And so we look at the, the, the personal unconscious and every aspect of that dream is symbolic of your personal unconscious, even down to the cat, you know, sitting on your lap. How do you feel about cats? What's, what's the symbolism of that cat? So we can look at it in terms of the symbolism of everything in the dream. So that's the personal unconscious level, that's level two. Um, and again, there's lots of techniques in terms of dialogue with dreams, physically act out your dreams if you can work with somebody else. Um, sharing your dream with someone, even just saying it to someone else, can that suddenly have a light bulb moment for you because you make a connection you wouldn't have otherwise have made. Or they'll reflect back their impression of that dream and suddenly you get it. It's like that aha thing. So it's quite hard to do it for yourself. It's all, it's really good if you can actually even just talk to somebody else about it and suddenly the aha, you know, might come as well. So dialoguing on a piece of paper or dialoguing actually with someone else mm -hmm. is a way of working with your dreams. Um, and then there's another technique that I call TTAQ. And this is borrowed from um, a lady called Justina Lasley, who has written a book called Handbook for, for Dream Group Leaders. And she's based in America. And it's a book about that, full of different techniques for working with your dreams. Loads of them. But the dialogue one is, is a good one. And the TTEQ is another really simple one, which means, so the, t the first T is theme. What's the theme? Just give your dream a title. What's the theme? Um, so, and, and the title, sorry, title first, and then the theme. What's the theme in, the, in this dream? Where is it? What's happening? Um, a is for affect, which is how do I feel in the dream? That's really important. Am I frightened? Am I happy? Am I sad? Am I curious? How did I feel in the dream? And then Q, question. What question is the dream asking me? So TTAQ, give it a title. What's the theme? How do I feel? What's the effect in the dream? What, what question is the dream asking of me? And that's a really simple, quick technique that you can use you know, in your, in your dream journaling. So that's level one, level two. Now level three is what you call cosmic dreams. Those are big, big dreams. Those are fundamental dreams you never forget your whole life. And I shared that the little shellfish that became the monster is one of those. That's it, you don't get many of them. And when you get them, I've had that dream 20 years, I can tell you every single detail of that dream even now 20 years, mm. years later. You know, they're so significant and you just know they are. And you wake up and it's a very important, it's like stamped in your DNA from then on. It's a big part of your journey. We don't often, we don't get many of them. The more people do this, do you think they'll get better at interpreting their dreams? The, the, the more they do this practice, that it's almost like a skill they'll learn. Is that yeah. the case? Yeah, that's right, Mark. Yeah, you, as, you, as you develop that dialogue with yourself, the, you know, it's the conversations get better. So, because your communication's getting better. It's like any relationship, you know, the deeper the connection, the better the conversation. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. The dream starts to become richer and you've got um, a richer language, if you like, from your dream life. So you've become better at understanding what's happening, definitely. But also your dreams start to elevate, they, they take it up a notch, you know, in terms of what they're trying to share. So if it's an amazing journey, uh, you've talked about your path to awakening. You've then talked about the work you've been doing with your dreams and then you've touched on the past and meditation. So 
um, annual a little bit about it, but it'd be great to hear in your own words the impact that's had. You know, like what is it? I suppose first for everyone else, but the second part is what impact has that had on your own growth and you know your sense of wellness and well-being. I'm very grateful that the pasta came into my life, and I'd never heard of it until 2012. And this is a year before my dad died in 2013, significant, actually, when I, when I heard about it. And the first time I heard about it, I was on Iona, writing poetry. And one of the other poets in the group I was with said, I really think you'd like the Pasna. What's that? It's a meditation. That's all she said. And I knew nothing more. Didn't do anything about it when I got home. A couple of months later, I was working in Leeds. I came down the stairs at the end of the day. I'd been working with a management team. And there was a lady at the bottom of the stairs. She said, you're Julian, aren't you? I'm like, yep. She said, I'm going on a Vipassana retreat. I really think you'd like it. And she took my email address and sent me all this stuff. And I met this woman in my life. I thought, okay, didn't do anything about it. A couple of months after that, I'm in York getting my hair cut. And my hairdresser, who's tuned into a yoga teacher, said, my yoga teacher's just come back from Vipassana, I think you'd love it. Like, right, that's it. <laughs> Three strikes within six months, I don't know what, what this is really all about, but I'm going. Um, and I signed up and I was going in, it was for the November, December of that year, 2012. And I didn't read much about it. Um, I knew it was a monastic setting, which it is. Um, and I had a look at the timetable and it's a gruelling timetable. So up at four in the morning, meditate from half past four in the morning. The first meditation is two hours to half past six. Then you get your breakfast. Um, it's uh, lunch is like 11 to 12 and then that's it. You don't eat anything else for the rest of the day. And you basically meditate for 10 hours a day until you go to your bed at nine o'clock and it's like set at half past nine. And it's 10 days of that. No speaking, no writing. No, no journaling my dreams, um, no looking at anyone, so no eye contact, and literally you're just within your own world for 10 days, meditating Whoa. for 10 hours a day. Um, my first Vipassana, oh, it, was, it was for six days, it was hell. Um, it was really, really, really tough. Um, they teach you um, Vipassana after four days so the first four days you're learning something called anapana which is awareness of your breath coming in and out here at your nostrils that's all all you do for 10 hours a day for four days is focus on your breath coming in and out of your nostrils a little triangle here and focus on the sensations that you feel that's all and they're teaching you to focus the mind basically really focus your attention the first four days um, it was anapana, so you're just focusing on this small space here under your nose. And then we start to do the pasana, which is we, we, we start taking our awareness through the whole of the body. And for me, by the time we got to, to, to day four, five and into day six, I was, I was sitting with what can only describe as solid block of concrete pain. Utter agony. I mean, pain that I have never felt in my entire life. My entire body felt like solidified pain. And we learn something on day five, which is called um, a sitting of strong determination, which means you sit for the whole hour of the meditation and you do not move a muscle. And there's one hour out of the 10 where they, they start to build up your resilience for this over the time. But there's one hour a day starts where you've got that sitting of strong determination. So you do not move. So even though you're sitting, and I, I can't do full lotus, but I can sit cross-legged, there's nothing, you're not in a chair, you're sitting on the floor on a, with a cushion. My entire body, solid rock pain. And I can remember really clearly, and it was day six, sitting in that strong determination meditation sit, with the tears pouring down my face because the pain was so bad. And I'd never felt pain like it. And every part of my body, everything was just solid pain, as I said. And I held my focus and all I said, and we're not meant to use mantras or anything, but all that could come into my mind was, I do this for the release of love, beauty, kindness and compassion. Love, beauty, kindness, compassion, over and over. 
I do this for my family, I do this for my nephews, I'm doing this for everybody, I will do this. And I held equanimity like I have never experienced utter stillness. I held and watched this pain. So I managed to find that observer place, complete equanimity, and in that split second that I achieved that, the pain, everything started to dissolve. All of the solidity started to break up. It was like little little tadpoles running through me, all the pain breaking up. And I sat and watched it. Everything just dissolved. And the last, I don't know how many minutes of the set, energy was just rushing up through my leg, up through my spine, out of my head. I had no pain whatsoever. And I just had energy rushing through me and at the end when of the sitting when you call it time at the end I was like a newborn lamb I, I sprung up from my seat you know from sitting down I, I didn't have cramp I didn't have pain I had nothing I was walking as if I was 10 feet tall I was just completely it was like being reborn again, which had already been reborn on the 20th of February. So again, <laughs> because I'd managed to hold equanimity and observe all of that pain and not move, not move from it at all. And ever since then, I've been utterly committed to my practice and done a 10-day retreat every year. Practical tips for anybody thinking of trying to track their dreams at home. What do they need? Okay. The very basics, buy a journal um, and keep it by your bed and make sure it's the first thing you do on waking up. So dreams are a bit like, like a cloud. So you wake up in the morning and it and it'll be there, but if you don't capture it immediately, it'll just be gone. Yeah, it'll drift away. So First thing, on waking, try not to move, just hold the dream, write it down, and then if you begin that process, it's called, it's like priming a pump. You start to, you know, crank the handle, not a lot's coming, you keep cranking the handle, water starts flowing, if you keep going, next thing you've got to flow. So it's just the commitment to actually wanting to remember, so the intention to remember, and practically have a journal and a pen or a pencil by your bed and keep it with you at all times. And just that practice of writing them down. Some people like to use dictaphone, some people like to type into the phone, but I think that wakes you up. So sometimes you might wake up at three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning. If you write the dream down, you can go back to sleep. So I just find it easier to actually jot them down and review them. So then so the next thing is, okay, let them just sit there, start to get used to the practice. And then maybe at the end of the week, sit down and look at the week's dreams and just review and look for themes and patterns. There's always themes and patterns. Your dreams are trying to tell you things that you don't know. It's always trying to bring awareness to something about yourself or your life that you're not aware of yet. So it's trying to bring you into balance and wholeness the whole time and guide you and support you in your decision making. And, and also about you know enhancing your creativity as well. So just by making that commitment to wanting to remember and then having a journal and a pen or a pencil and doing it, practicing doing it every day and it'll become um, a relationship that you'll treasure. Like and subscribe to your evolution channel. Tell us what you thought about Juliet's video in the comments below. <laughs> <laughs> Hi <laughs> One, two, three, subscribe! <laughs>